think it's absolutely fair to say at this moment in time, we can't pin down exactly what's causing the problems with the smallmouth bass. You shouldn't have specific species in a river that has those type of lesions or that type of open sore. The notes right now coming out of Virginia are the fish population is on its way to repairing itself. So that this could be just a natural cycle. I think many of us believe that it's a, a mix of weather conditions, flow, potentially some discharges. We wanted just to make sure that the open sores aren't directly related to water quality. The nature of the Susquehanna River study is so in-depth that we have dedicated one person just to manage this study. My name is Josh Lookenbill. I'm a biologist with the Pennsylvania DEP, and we are charged with monitoring and assessing the water quality of the Susquehanna River. To stop pollution, first you gotta find it. You gotta isolate it and you gotta identify it. You gotta be able to characterize it and quantify it. How much of it is bad? How much of it is in the river? And where is it coming from? The main thing we're looking at is water quality. And the way we do that is one, collect water chemistry samples. Another thing we do is we deploy water quality monitors in stream that collect data on a real time basis. We find nutrients, we find nitrogen and phosphorus. We also find different levels of heavy metals. A lot of the heavy metals are associated with uh, our historic acid mine drainage. We also sample biology. Bugs are a great indicator of the water quality in the stream or in the river. We're sampling paraphyton or epiphytic algae. That's the stuff that grows on the rocks. We pick rocks along a transect, but in random locations, and we are scrubbing all the algae off the rocks, and then we're gonna do analysis of that algal community. Some of the thoughts are that different water quality characteristics will cause different types of algae to grow. So we're gonna analyze a, a whole lot of those kind of things to try to get an idea of how the water quality from the east side of the river to the middle of the river to the west of the river, how that's different if it is. We also deploy what we call passive samplers. Passive samplers have a membrane in them that have an affinity for different pollutants. And these are typically non-traditional pollutants. These are the emerging contaminants that are difficult to sample, and difficult for the lab to detect. There are things that are happening um, pretty much nationwide related to um, emerging contaminants and um, those type of personal hygiene products, things like that that folks are starting to see in water courses, but it's certainly not just a Pennsylvania uh, concern. From bath soap to certain hair products to um, the medicines we take, and even quite a few of the antibacterial soaps that folks are currently pretty fond of. It's interesting because it's only you know, within the last couple years, that lab analysis has gotten to the place where we can actually see these compounds and attempt to determine in what amount they might be present. These are contaminants that can cause problems to, to us, uh, to the fish, to the bugs, to the biology in the stream at very minute quantities. And these mi very minute quantities, we have a very difficult time of detecting. So we have to evolve and deploy different sampling techniques to actually collect and then be able to analyze and find those. The quality of the water is a reflection of, of me as a person and it's also reflective of me as a biologist. I would put our staff here up against any biologist in the nation. I have never worked with people who are so dedicated and talented. We have a, a bi-weekly meeting on their progress and to sit with them and listen to what they consider to be, oh yeah, that's what we did that day, is just overwhelming in terms of the amount of work they're accomplishing and the amount that they're learning. The amount of time we've put into uh, collecting data on the river and its tributaries to look into this problem, it's, it's quite significant. 
I like this job a lot. I was an engineer once, and uh, you sat at a cubicle looking out the window wishing you were outside. I think we're dealing with cultural issues here. Uh, obviously, we have many millions of you know, people living in the Susquehanna Basin, and everything that you do in that basin, whether it's farming or just household activities, you know, taking a bath, washing the dishes, doing your laundry, eventually most of that, if not all of it, winds up in the river system. How much do we value this river? Do we value it enough to spend millions of dollars to enhance our sewage treatment plants, uh, to help ensure that uh, people practicing agriculture are helping prevent nutrients from flowing off their landscape? Do you spread fertilizer on your yard? Those are all decisions we have to be prepared to make. We have kind of a saying in here, you know, the more you look, the more you find. So we're out there and we're finding some things that we'd like to address long term. But I think you have to be optimistic. We'll continue to stay committed until we've collected enough information and enough data to support our next move. There's a lot of things going on in the Susquehanna Basin. It's a huge basin. The water quality is changing. For the most part, it is for the better.